This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 46. Coming up on Space Time. Hunting for dark galaxies. The massive Martian ice discovery, opening a new window on the red planet's history. And the ticking time bomb of Betelgeuse. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. An ancient collision with a newly discovered dark dwarf galaxy may be responsible for the Milky Way's characteristic outer disk ripples. The findings, reported on the pre-pressed physics website archive.org, follow last year's discovery of the Intellitu Dwarf Galaxy during the second data release from the European Space Agency's Gaia mission. Gaia is charting the most detailed three-dimensional map of our galaxy and surrounding regions ever undertaken. Antilla 2 is a dwarf galaxy of the Milky Way, located some 422 light years away in the southern constellation of Antilla the Pump. The galaxy is similar in size to the Large Magellanic Cloud, which makes it about a tenth the size of the Milky Way, but it's about 10,000 times fainter than the LMC. In fact, it has the lowest surface brightness of any galaxy yet discovered, and is about 100 times more diffuse than any other known ultra-diffuse galaxy. The study's lead author, Associate Professor Sukanya Kakrabati from the Rochester Institute of Technology, says the dwarf galaxy's location closely matches the location of a dark matter-dominated dwarf galaxy originally predicted through a dynamical analysis back in 2009. Using the Gaia data, Kakrabati calculated the dwarf galaxy's past trajectory and found that Antilla 2 would have crashed into the Milky Way eons ago, producing the large ripples seen in the outer gas disk of our galaxy. Upcoming additional data releases from Gaia will provide further clarity, and they should allow the authors to predict the motions of stars within Antilla 2. Kakrabati argues that if Antilla 2 is the dwarf galaxy which she predicted back in 2009, then she has a pretty good handle on what its orbit should be, and that in turn has allowed her to determine just how close it came to the Milky Way's galactic disk in the past. Importantly, it also sets stringent constraints, therefore, not only on the dwarf galaxy's mass, but also its density profile. And that means Antilla 2 could ultimately be used as a unique laboratory to learn more about the nature of that mysterious substance called dark matter. Scientists have no idea what dark matter is, although they know it makes up more than 80% of all the matter in the universe. Chakrabarti and colleagues also explored other potential causes for the ripples in the Milky Way's outer disk, but after careful examination they've ruled out those other candidates. For example, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy's tidal strength is insufficient, and the large and small Magellanic Clouds are simply too distant. All the evidence points to Antilla 2 as the most likely candidate. This is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Scientists say newly discovered layers of ice buried almost two kilometres beneath the Martian North Pole are the remnants of ancient polar ice sheets, which could be one of the largest water reserves on the Red Planet. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, will provide scientists with a detailed record of the past climate on Mars, in much the same way that tree rings and ice core samples provide a record of past climates on Earth. The discovery is based on radar wave measurements by NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The study's lead author, Stefano Nerosi from the University of Texas, says studying the geometry and composition of these layers could tell scientists whether the climatic conditions on the red planet were previously favourable for life. The authors found layers of sand and ice that were as much as 90% water in some places. If melted, the newly discovered polar ice would equate to a global layer of water around Mars some 1.5 metres deep. In fact, it likely makes up the third largest water reservoir on the red planet after the current polar ice caps. Nerosi and colleagues think the layers formed when ice accumulated at the poles during past ice ages on Mars. And each time the planet warmed, a remnant of the ice caps became covered by sand, which then protected the ice from solar radiation, preventing it from sublimating into the atmosphere. Martian ice ages are thought to be caused by dramatic changes in the planet's orbit and axial tilt. Over a period of about 50,000 years or so, Mars tends to lean more towards the Sun, gradually returning to an upright position, sort of like a wobbling spinning top. 
When the planet spins upright, the equator faces the sun, allowing the polar ice caps to grow. And as the planet tilts, the ice caps become exposed more directly to the sun, retreating and perhaps even vanishing entirely. Scientists had thought the ice caps were lost, but the new research shows that significant ice sheet remnants have survived under the planet's surface, trapped in alternating bands of ice and sand, like layers on a cake. This study also provides new, important insights into the exchange of water ice between the poles and the mid-latitudes, where scientists have already confirmed the presence of widespread glaciers. Surprisingly, the total volume of all the water locked up in these buried polar deposits is roughly the same as all the water known to exist in the glaciers and in buried ice layers at lower Martian latitudes, and they're approximately the same age too. Studying this record of past polar glaciation could help determine whether Mars was ever habitable. Understanding how much water was available globally versus what's trapped in the poles is important if you're going to have liquid water on Mars. After all, you can have all the right conditions for life, but if most of that water is locked up at the poles, then it becomes difficult to have sufficient amounts of liquid water near the equator. And of course, water is essential for life as we know it. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. A new study has revealed the Earth's mantle to be a far more geochemically diverse mosaic than previously thought. The planet's mantle is some 2,900 kilometres thick, stretching from the planet's crust down to its outer core. In fact, it's the largest single layer of Earth. Despite popular belief, the mantle is predominantly solid, although it behaves more like a viscous fluid over geological timescales. Partial melting of the mantle at mid-ocean ridges produces oceanic crust and continental crust at subduction zones. The mantle's also dotted with hotspot plumes of molten material extending up from the core mantle boundary to the planet's surface. The new findings reported in the journal Nature Geoscience paints an intricate picture of the mantle as something far more complex than the relatively uniform lavas which eventually reach the planet's surface. Well, that's a problem because science's best access to the mantle comes in the form of lava that erupts at mid-ocean ridges on the seafloor and which are producing new ocean crust. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor Sarah Lambert from the University of Utah, says samples of this lava show that it's chemically mostly the same everywhere on the planet. But the thing is, that's at odds with what's happening at the other end of the crust's life cycle. Old oceanic crust spreads away from the mid-ocean ridges until it's shoved beneath the continent, sinking back down into the mantle. And what happens after that is somewhat unclear. But the mantle and the old crust melt should provide a degree of variation in the chemical composition of the magmas. So Lambert and colleagues decided to discover what the mantle looks like before it rises as lava at the mid-ocean ridge. They examined core drill samples taken through the ocean crust in order to look at cumulant minerals, the first minerals to crystallize when magmas enter the crust, examining the chemical composition from the most primitive parts of these minerals. The authors looked at variations in isotopes of neodymium and strontium, which can indicate different chemistries of mantle material which come from different types of rock. They found the amount of isotope variability in the cumulates was seven times greater than that in the mid-ocean rich lavas, and that suggests the mantle is far from well mixed. Lambert says that's probably because different rocks are melting at different temperatures. As different materials melt, they form separate channels that transport different magmas up to the crust. The end result is several networks of channels that are all converging towards the mid-ocean ridge but don't mix. That final mixing, the thing which is giving lavas all over the world the same sort of composition, must be happening somewhere in the crust. The mystery deepens. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Okay, time for a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. There is a sense of pride that comes with being able to talk confidently, intelligently about a subject, or to be the only one with the right answer on Trivia Night. And that's why I love The Great Courses Plus. They make me sound smarter. With this live streaming service, I have the freedom to talk about virtually any topic, not just the basics, but becoming a true master of it, learning unique perspectives from top engaging experts in their fields. There's unlimited access to thousands of lectures on topics like the astronomical structure of Machu Picchu, the science of extreme weather, even science fiction literature or martial arts. And with the Great Courses Plus app, you have the flexibility to watch or listen just about anywhere, anytime, during the daily commute, on a long-haul flight, or on a lazy weekend afternoon. 
Now, a course that I've been checking out is Understanding the Quantum World. It's taught by quantum physicist Professor Erica Carlson. Now, I know the quantum world can be really dense and confusing to people, but this course is really fascinating, and it puts quantum physics into an easy-to-understand fashion. Professor Carlton does a brilliant job of explaining what seem like outright baffling concepts. She puts it in plain, simple language that anyone can understand, and provides many of those light bulb moments during this course. Now, don't misunderstand me. This course is going to challenge your concepts on how physical objects behave, but also provides you with the reasoning behind it, making the complicated simple. It explores the inner workings of magnets, colour vision, lightning, how an electron can be in two places at once. There's quantum superpositioning, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, quantum tunnelling and much more. And it's all possible thanks to the Great Courses Plus. And for our space-time listeners, we have a special free trial offer. Unlimited access to their entire library. All you need to do is sign up through our special URL. That way you can help support the program while at the same time consuming a smorgasbord of knowledge. So sign up now at thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And of course, we'll put the link details in the show notes, and you can find them on the Space Time website. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time. Space Time. With Stuart Gary. Betelgeuse is a massive ticking time bomb destined to explode as one of the nearest supernovae to Earth, and it could happen any time. Located approximately 643 light years away, Betelgeuse is the brightest star in the constellation Orion the Hunter and the ninth brightest star in the night sky. Betelgeuse began its life about 10 million years ago as a blue giant. It's now evolved off the main sequence into a red supergiant. The main sequence is where stars fuse hydrogen in their core into helium. Calculations of Betelgeuse's mass range from slightly under 10 to slightly over 20 times that of the Sun, with some 100,000 times the Sun's brightness. Now, although I'm calling the star Betelgeuse because that's the most popular way astronomers pronounce its name, it's also commonly called Betelgeuse. But both Betelgeuse and Betelgeuse are actually tortured mispronunciations of its original Arabic name, Abtelyazi meaning the hand of the big man, the big man being Orion the Hunter. Betelgeuse has already moved off the main sequence. It's now converting progressively heavier and heavier elements. Eventually, it'll start producing iron in its core, and that will trigger the star's death, causing it to collapse and explode as a massive supernova. And that's likely to happen any day now, which in astronomical terms could mean tomorrow, or it could mean 100,000 years from now. It's not the nearest known supernova candidate to Earth. That's I.K. Pegasi, a binary star system comprising a normal white-yellow main sequence star and a white dwarf, located 150 light-years away. While the nearest massive star destined to go supernova is Spica, a blue-white binary located some 260 light-years away. Still, when Betelgeuse does explode, it's likely to be a bigger blast, temporarily outshining all the other stars in the Milky Way galaxy, and clearly visible in daylight hours from here on Earth. Betelgeuse is featured in the new issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, and joining us now with all the details of the July issue of the magazine is its editor, Jonathan Nally. That could easily, that star could easily be uh, the next one to go. In fact, in the July issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we have an article all about that, about that, that particular star, Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, however you pronounce it. Yeah, say it and say three times. And, 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 <laughs> say it three times. Ooh. And yeah, the, the whole background of that star and why it, it's due to go bang um, and how long it will be before it goes bang. Of course, the other one that's a likely contender is Eta Carina. Yep, yep, that's another one. That's one in the southern sky that is a fabulous, huge-looking star, and it's part of a beautiful uh, complex of nebulae. And, oh, it's a fantastic area. You can get out there with a pair of binoculars and sweep through that part of the southern sky. Perfect time for doing it this time of year because that region of the sky is up nice and high through the Milky Way there. And when that goes, that could even be a magnetar because that's, uh, that's a really big blue star, or well, two really big blue stars really orbiting each other. That's right, yeah, yeah. So um, the, the chances of this happening in our lifetime, of course, very, very slim. But any day now in astronomical terms could mean in our lifetime or it could be a million years from now. That's right, yeah. So in astronomical terms, they are due to go bang. And on the, the time scale of the star's lives, uh, 100,000 years is a blink of an eye. So um, yeah, as far as they're concerned, uh, any day now. Pers- personifying a star, any day now. But as far as we're concerned, uh, we're going to miss out for sure. Uh, we saw 1987A. That's good. Happy with that. Another few centuries were well and good. And of course, we don't want one going off too nearby. But for 
unfortunately, there aren't any that are too nearby that are going to give us any concern. Do you realise if Betelgeuse was in the centre of our solar system where the sun is, its outer surface would be as far out as Jupiter in its orbit around the sun? Well, I can imagine that, but of course, if it were real, I wouldn't be here, would I? No, you'd probably be uh, fried like a cinder, although not as hot as the sun. It's only about 2,000 degrees out there, 2,600, which is why it's bright red in colour right now. That's, that's a bit too hot for me. 50 years since Apollo 11, the first manned lunar landing. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, it was a pretty amazing time and nothing, none more amazing than, of course, Apollo 11. So, yeah, 50th anniversary of coming up. And in the July issue of Australian Sky and Telescope, we take a look at the role that Australia's very own Parkes Radio Telescope played in that mission. The dish. More, the dish, yeah, the famous dish. and belongs to the CSIRO now, the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation. It played a small role. Of course, it, it didn't launch them to the moon or anything like that. But what it did was it helped get the signals back from the moon. So it received the TV signals of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin making their famous moonwalk. Uh, NASA had asked... Australia if they could press the Parks dish into service as a basically a backup, if you like, for their own dishes. That was the um, Honeysuckle, wasn't it? The, uh, it was Honeysuckle Creek, yeah, yeah, and there were a couple of other ones. And the, and the big one in California was meant to be, at Goldstone, yeah. was meant to be the primary one. So it all depended on when exactly they made this moonwalk after they landed. Initially, it was thought that they would... Um, Have a rest period, I believe. I think the first one was they're going, to, they're going to get straight out, and they thought, no, we're going to be too hyped up, we need to have a rest first. So they decided to they were going to have a rest first. After they landed, they thought, no, we're too hyped up. We might as well get out and <laughs> go and do it. Yes. But then it, it took so long to get into their spacesuits and everything, much longer than they thought, that they ended up being back on the pretty much the original schedule anyway. So anyway, long story. You can, you can read all about it in the magazine. But what happened was that the signal that was coming through NASA's dishes ended up being not quite as good as that coming through Parks. So for almost all of the uh, moonwalk, NASA chose the Park signal for the TV broadcast that went all around the world. And while I think of it too, uh, there's, of course, 50th anniversary, there are going to be lots and lots of different sorts of celebrations held all around the countryside, which we cover in the magazine, oh, in Brisbane and Sydney and Parks and all sorts of places. So Parks itself is going to have a public open day. So it's in the middle of New South Wales, central New South Wales, but well worth a visit if you haven't been there before. It's an amazing place with this big radio telescope dish and they've got a fantastic visitor centre and everything. And so over the uh, the weekend of the anniversary of Apollo 11, they're going to have public open days too, so you can get up close and have a look at where all the action happened. And I'd really recommend you do so. So talking about telescopes, that's of course a big professional radio telescope, but did you know you can 3D print your own backyard telescope? You can 3D print the bits for your own normal optical telescope that uses a mirror. Ah. So let's start from scratch. So in the old days, in the old days, go back 50 years, 60 years or longer, amateur astronomers basically most of the time made their own telescopes because stuff was expensive, but um, bits and pieces you had in your shed or you get from the local scrapyard was cheap. So people made their own telescopes, they even made their own mirrors. They got a blank piece of glass and they ground it into the, the right sort of concave shape in the middle to give it a parabolic surface. And that's what amateur astronomers had been doing for a couple of centuries or so. So that was the way things were done. But then when we got into the era of mass production of um, amateur telescopes and the sort of stuff you, you might buy in a department store or, or, or better ones, and the prices came down. And then particularly when China opened up and became this sort of market economy and people shifted their uh, manufacturing to China, uh, the, the cost of telescopes just came way, way down. So the whole thing of amateur astronomers building their own telescopes just sort of disappeared largely for a long, long time. And it still has basically disappeared. I mean, the, the sort of amazing telescopes you can buy these days, these computerized things, you wouldn't bother building one of those yourself because they, you can just buy them off the shelf and they're tremendous. But what, what happens if you want to build a particular kind of telescope that no one out there makes? So this fellow in America has built himself what's called a binoscope or a binocular telescope where you use both eyes to look through rather than just using one looking through an eyepiece because you get much better view through using two eyes and it's more natural too to have both eyes open at a time and be able to see through. But you can't just sort of buy a binocular telescope off the shelf. So this guy was pretty clever. He he was in the business, so he knew about all about computer-aided design, that sort of thing. And he thought, why don't I just 3D print one of these things? You know, I can design the whole thing to my exact specifications on my computer and then just get it made. So initially, he was sending his designs out to these sort of jobbing factories where they will use their 3D printer to make the bit for you and then send it back. He started doing that and then figured out, I'm oh, much better if I just bought my own little machine and then I can do it myself, which he did. And so he's just 
just 3D printed about 70% of all the parts of his telescope and it's a most amazing thing. It's very compact and it folds up into basically nothing. They can put it together in a matter of minutes. Anyone can use it. It's so easy. It's just intuitive and it's exactly the right size and has exactly the features that he wants. So this is the way it's going to go, I think. You know, people are going to use these um, 3D printers and computer-aided design. You can download his plans and probably plans from lots of other ones as well. And if you don't have your own 3D printer, you can send the plans to someone who does and they'll print it out for you. You just put it all together and away you go. Isn't that amazing? It's almost like a Star Trek style replicator. It's, it's, it's like that, isn't it? That's the way things are going. Um, it's really incredible and you can choose different sorts of materials to make the different parts of it. So he's using plastic resin things that, have got Im- Im- that are impregnated with carbon fibre powder, that kind of thing, which means it's very light but very strong uh, and it keeps its shape because you don't want telescopes warping because that gives you a distorted view. So I just think this is amazing. This is, this is the way things are going to go. People are going to... I, I can see it in 20 years from now, every home will have a 3D printer of some kind, just like you've got a you know an inkjet printer. Uh, yeah. We'll have a 3D printer and you just print all sorts of things, whether it's a telescope or a new car or whatever. Just print it yourself and put it all together. It's going to be amazing. It's going to mean that people will be creating and making things for themselves again, sort of like they were in the early days of making telescopes, but all the trial and error will have gone and you can do things to your own exact specifications and it's almost inspiring me to go and get one and do it as well. That's Jonathan Nally, editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Russia's space forces have launched a new military navigation satellite. The GLONASS-M was flown aboard a Soyuz 21B rocket equipped with a frigate upper stage from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome 800 kilometers north of Moscow. It's the first launch from Plesetsk this year. The GLONASS-27 satellite constellation is Russia's version of the American GPS, Chinese Bidou and European Galileo satellite navigation systems. Meanwhile, a Russian proton rocket has launched the nation's most powerful ever telecommunications satellite. The heavy lift Proton M, equipped with the Breeze M upper stage, blasted off from the Baikonur Cosmodrome, lighting up the night skies over the Central Asian Republic of Kazakhstan. The mission, which was the first launch of a proton rocket this year, carried the Yamal 601 into geostationary transfer orbit. Built by Thales Linear Space, the 5-ton satellite is equipped with 18C band, 19KU band and 26KA band transponders. It's been positioned 26,000 kilometres above the equator with a footprint to provide video, data and broadband services over Russia, Europe, the Middle East, North Africa and Southeast Asia for at least the next 15 years. India has successfully launched its new RISAT 2B Earth Observation Radar Imaging Satellite. The 615-kilogram probe was launched aboard a PSLV rocket from the Shatish Dhawan Space Centre on the Bay of Bengal coast. The satellite was deployed into a 555-kilometre high orbit 15 and a half minutes after launch. The Resat 2B is designed to study agriculture, forestry and aid in disaster management. The mission was the 72nd launch of a PSLV rocket. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study has confirmed that increasing your red meat intake, especially processed meats, may be leading you closer to the grave. However, the findings reported in the British Medical Journal also suggest that cutting down your red meat intake and increasing healthy protein sources such as whole grains and veggies could lower that risk over time. Scientists found that an average increase of three and a half servings of red meat, both processed and unprocessed, was associated with a 10% higher risk of dying in the next eight years. A new study warns that if your teenage kids are sexting, they're probably having sex as well. The findings reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association suggest that teens who sext are more likely to be sexually active, more likely to have multiple sexual partners, more likely to internalize problems, and more likely to show signs of substance use. The report reviewed multiple recent studies looking at sexting, sexual activity, and mental health. The authors say parents need to prioritize education for their kids so that they have the tools they need to navigate their personal and social development in an increasingly technological world. Now, while we're talking about the digital age, a new study has found that the internet can produce both acute and sustained alterations in specific areas of the brain. 
The findings reported in the journal World Psychiatry suggest that these changes affect cognition, including attention capacities, memory processes, and social interactions. The research was carried out by scientists from the University of Western Sydney, Harvard University, King's College, Oxford University, and the University of Manchester. Well, it's something we've all probably suspected, but now a new study has confirmed that when it comes to dating, people really do have a type. The findings reported in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences shows people often look for love with the same type of person over and over again. The multi-year study looked at couples and families across several age groups and suggests looking to date a different type of person after a breakup might be a lot easier said than done. Researchers compared the personalities of current and past partners of 332 people, finding a significant consistency in the personalities of an individual's romantic partners. And while we're on the subject of romance, a new study has found biomarkers which influence male sexual orientation. The findings reported in the journal PNAS provides new insights into how early life biology shapes the brain and behaviour. The biomarkers include the participants' number of older brothers, rate of left versus right-handedness, and the presence of gay and or bisexual male relatives in their families. Previous studies had looked at individual biomarkers, but this is the first to consider whether there's some interaction or association between these influences. Participants who belong to one of the subgroups that showed biomarkers are more likely to report same-sex interactions. The study also found differences between the subgroups on measures of psychological characteristics which previous research had suggested were associated with male sexual orientation. The subgroup without these biomarkers conformed to the most masculine gender roles, whereas the subgroup with greater numbers of older brothers among their siblings scored higher on measures of feminine gender role expression and agreeableness. The International Atomic Energy Agency says Iran has increased its production of enriched uranium. Last month, the UN agency found Tehran's stockpiles of enriched uranium and heavy water were growing. The confirmation follows Washington's decision last year to reimpose sanctions on the Islamic Republic over its ongoing nuclear program, its continuing missile development, and its funding of major terrorist organizations, including Hamas, Islamic Jihad, and Hezbollah. Last week, German Foreign Minister Hiko Maas called on Iran to avoid any escalation and stick to its commitments to the nuclear deal. Speaking during a visit to Tehran, Maas warned Iran risked further isolation on the international stage and more instability in the region. But the all-rich nation insists its nuclear program is for peaceful power generation only. The latest confirmation follows increased tensions in the Persian Gulf after Tehran was blamed for a series of massive explosions which have badly damaged four cargo ships in the busy seaway. Well, time now for one of the silliest stories we've had in quite some time, and in the grand tradition of flat earthers and fake Apollo 11 lunar landing conspiracy theories, comes claims from a man claiming to be a time traveller from the year 2082 who has provided the world's media, at least those gullible enough to listen, with what he says is a photograph he took of dinosaurs during a recent trip to the past. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the claims could be funny if they didn't highlight the fantasies some people are condemned to live in. Oh dear. Yeah, this is someone from the future, supposedly has gone back to 66 million years ago and is now showing us a photo now of a T-Rex. And it looks like it's sort of running across a very dry, deserty landscape. And in the background is some high mountains, snow-capped mountains. And you look at the photo, it's a bad photo. It looks a bit like it's been painted rather than uh, an actual photo. These T-Rex running across the landscape has a shadow uh, which looks exactly like the image reversed and the shadows on one side of the T-Rex and the lighting is coming from the same side so the shadow's in the wrong place. Everything about it is wrong. (laughs) People are saying it's such bad photoshopping or CGI could have been done years ago. Probably one of those things we shouldn't spend too much time on because quite frankly everything about it is wrong. The fellow who actually has the video has pixelated his face because he's frightened of being recognised which if he was would probably indicate it's not from 2082. Well it'd be affecting the time stream then wouldn't he? <laughs> he would very much be. It's like, can you ever read the story Distant Thunder? I think it's by Bradbury. Yes, by Bradbury. yes, yes. I've yes. seen the movie. Yes, yes I know and it's, sort of, it's, it's you don't want to go messing with T-Rexes or butterflies back then but yes I mean this is one of many things where you get someone who's possibly it's hard to say, has some uh, personal issues and uh, just believes what he's doing. Probably quite sincerely believes that uh, what he has is a, is a photo. How he believes he travelled back in time, I do not know. But uh, the photo is not, it's poor evidence. 
Uh, Are there more thing. people like this coming to the surface of the uh, flotsam and jetsam of humanity now than, than before? Is it just that we're hearing about more of them because of the access of social media? I, I would say it's the latter. The fact that, yeah, sort of technology has revealed these people, empowered them to make themselves known. If anyone in the sceptics way back when, and the start, we used to get uh, letters and photos from strange people, sad people really, all the time, but nowhere near as much as now because social media it allows everybody to put their name up or put their photo up and you know, make a little video, etc., and uh, show to the world what's happening. I mean, letters take a while to write, emails don't. These photos can be created very quickly, videos can be created very quickly. So it is very much a factor of social media that we know about these people, but I would say it's not necessarily more prevalent than before. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 